So let me start by just um, asking you some questions about yourself so people get to know you a little bit in the States. Uh, this will be going out mainly to people in the States, but also around the world. So um, you have a famous Jungian name, Guggenbühl. Uh, yes. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> My, my father was uh, Adolf Guggenbühl Craig. He was a Jungian psychologist, and actually, uh, I was brought up in a Jungian background. So you know, I got to know as a child James Hillman, Raphael Lopez. But also, it goes actually farther back. My grand aunt was analyzed by some guy called Freud, living in Vienna. What? <laughs> so I was actually embedded in psychological thinking. It's part of my brains. Part of your brain, it was hopeless. You had no other choice. You had to become an analyst. Hopeless. No other choice than to think in Jungian terms. So, uh, yeah. I was completely socialized. But I think it's actually a, it's, it was an opportunity, actually. Now, you you grew up in quite a large family. There were how many children? Four or five children? Well, we I have four siblings, two sisters and two brothers. So, we yeah. grew up in a large family, yes. And it's an old Swiss family, I think, huh? Well, it's it's a Swiss family. It, it's not that old. It only goes back to the 13th century. So you know, only. <laughs> it's might be a bit different. So yeah, but it's called actually the Devil's Hill. So uh, yeah, our ancestors they lived on a hill, which apparently used to be a, a site for uh, heathen temples. And afterwards, one called people who lived on the hills where they had heathen temples. What one called them. Devil's Hill, because uh, everything which was heathen, you know, Wotan and all these, they contributed yeah. to the devil. So that's why we got that name. That's why you're a little bit it's devilish. A location. Yeah. <laughs> well, your career as a Jungian analyst is, is very different from most Jungian analysts. Um, in that you're, you're much more public. Uh, most analysts work quietly in a private office, seeing one person at a time, individual psychotherapy. But you um, really have specialized in, in group work, working with uh, and, and, uh, in very public venues. Um, can you say something about that, how you came to extend the, the, the Jungian ideas out into the world further than the um, it was actually never my. It was never my distinct goal to sort of uh, make a mission out of Jungian psychology, but it came more or less out of frustration or dealing with conflicts, dealing with violence, the different positions I've got, dealing with education. So I was actually looking for answers. You know, how could we? How could you solve conflict? How could you actually make children, uh, you know, to get motivated to learn? So, but then I realized that actually in Jungian psychology is a very, a lot of very sound answers, which are applicable to many issues in life out there. So I think it's a pity that Jungian psychology is only practiced in a, like in a solitary way in, uh, in practice. It's something, Jungian psychology has a lot of strength and the great ideas, which actually help in a lot of issues. So. That I was, was my print, was my motive. It was actually having to deal mm. with challenges where, where I needed answers. And I think Jungian psychology gave a lot of answers. Well, can you give an example? I know, for instance, that you, you've been doing a lot of work in, in, um, in Eastern Europe, in Georgia. Um, uh, maybe you could just say something about your work in one of these uh, locations and how you bring uh, the relevance of Jungian psychology into um, very unusual settings. Well, in Georgia, I have a project where we try to help these refugees children from Caucasia, you know, from uh, South Ossetia and from Abkhazia, which actually are in these uh, very dreadful camps and don't, don't have any real future. And uh, so actually, uh, I was I got commissioned sort of to try to help them to have a perspective. And the problem was they didn't actually, you know, they were all entangled internally in their problems, their issues. A, a lot of them, when they got a bit older, became violent. So we realized we can't just go there and tell them, you know, what not to do. We have to give them something. And in order to give them something, we have to find out what is their belief system. 
what actually what are they striving for? And their ex Jungian psychology was rather helpful because we realized they're actually searching for myths, searching for personal stories which give them a sense of belonging to the world, a sense of uh, value. And so we started working with myths, those kind of stories which we found in their cultures, and tried to um, encounter them, give them vessels where they could experience the strength of their myths, play them out, and find them concrete solutions in their lives. So uh, we found it as a very potent approach not just to refugee children in, uh, in Georgia, also in Cambodia, and uh, working with it also in um, China. So it actually, I think, Jungian psychology has a very, uh, you know, can a very strong approach to many very difficult issues in. And that's because of our um, our understanding of the of the psyche as as being made up of. Uh, uh, mythological motifs, or the archetypal motifs that we can draw on these sort of spiritual resources to create meaningful narratives. Is that how you see it? The, the concept of archetypes, I think, is a great uh, concept because the big problem is with us human beings that we, we develop a lot of tunnel vision, that we start to focus on one particular issue and think this is the answer, and if the others adhere to our answers, then actually the problem is solved. Often it's a lot more complicated. There's a lot many, there's many more issues which we did, can't detect. So actually, um, we have to find a way to open up our mind. We have to find a way to broaden our mind. And there, the concept of archetype comes in very handy because according to archetypes, there are distinct, different approaches to issues. So you can approach an issue according to the archetype of the trickster, or you can approach it the, the Paulinian way. So and these basic approaches, these are somehow ingrained in our culture and in our psyche. So when you deal with a conflict, with an issue, you have to think on different lines. And you have to realize that the answer you might adhere to continuously, or the answer which maybe your personality might produce, is not a unique there's other possibilities. And the advantage of archetype is because it's connected to mythology. I think one of the big, big problems psychology has nowadays, they don't respect history and mythology. Mythology is a great arena where you can find wonderful stories, wonderful images, which help us to understand ourselves understand and to act in different ways. I mean, there's such an emphasis on behavior these days and, uh, um, you know, the um, um, alteration of behavior, violent behavior, so and so on, and uh, behavior modification through cognitive methods. It is a kind of um, cognitive method, isn't it, that you use? I mean, but drawing on the unconscious and on, on image and myth to um, Get the brain to think in different ways about one's life situation. Actually, when you look at cognitive psychology, you know they're starting to develop, to discover the narrative, the importance of the narrative, and yeah. if you compare it, you know it's basically that what human psychology has been saying all along. So actually, when you deal with issues with problematic or disturbed juveniles, you have to somehow focus primarily on the mind. Because violence and conflict, they start in the mind or psyche. So you have mm -hmm. to try to define an image, a story, which somehow reaches them, which somehow touches them. And once you've got that, then you can actually concentrate on the behavior. The behavior, you can't just concentrate on the behavior alone, because then you somehow, you, you, you don't respect the background and everything starts in a certain terrain, internal terrain, that's where it develops. So that's actually, actually the approach I has developed is not so, it's Jungian, but it has a lot of, uh, in cognitive psychology and in, in the discussions I follow there, there's a lot of similarities. Now you call your approach mythodrama, is this, um... 
the combination of, of uh, the, the Jungian and mythological approach and psychodrama, or how did you come up with this term and what does it mean? The term drama points out that we're not just talking, you know, it's just uh, relating uh, images and myths, but we, there's also a very concrete part, meaning playing out, acting, making a drama out of it, a concrete drama. So, because it also has to become symbolized, so it has to become concrete in certain ways, because that way it's, it's, it's easier for us to, to work on that uh, inner symbols which we produce. So drama is actually emphasizing, what is pointing out the concrete aspect of. So when you have a mythodrama session, you have a, set, a part where you relate the story, where you think of the story, and the imagination, the phase where you imagine, but then it always ends in something more concrete, which is then a reconnection to the everyday lives of these people. Well, you, you also do mythodrama with quotes or more normal groups. I know you're going to do one with the um, participants at ISAP in a few weeks. Uh, I plan to come to that. It should be very interesting. Um, how do you get started um, in a day of mythodrama. What is the first thing you do? How do you get people engaged and, and get the juices of their imagination flowing? Well, of course, one has to realize there's always different levels of depth, of course. So we use mythodrama in very long, you know, for longer time periods, weekly sessions. But in this, you know, one day periods, it's actually, we do something different. The very first step we do, we try to find out what is on the mind of that particular group. What's the focus? What worries the group? What's the problem? What's the challenge of that particular group? That's the first step. And then we name it. We give it a distinct name, which has to be accepted by the particular group. We have problems with talking to each other, communication. So that's what we do. But also, we usually make short interviews with indiv individuals to try to find out what is, what is the background. Then they join, we join in a group. And then the first part is always a bit fooling around, you know, playing, game, because one has to loosen up. Because mm -hmm. if one is too concentrated, too think, you know, if you think too much, one can't be really creative. So loosening up is important, or warm ups, so depends. And so this is always done according to the group, you know, what the group likes to do. And then the third part comes where we actually relate the story. The story is always told by heart spontaneously, so by telling it, it might change. So the storyteller has to let him or herself be influenced by the group. And the story, it, the distinct stories we tell, it's not just a story from, from a book, but it's a story which has to contain images which mirror the possible experiences of the group. And this is something which is not that easy. You have to use a lot of intuition. It also has to contain so-called mental movers, uh, details, items, which start, uh, you think. It also has to contain specific, uh, be about specific figures, figures, you know, like archetypes. So we have a whole philosophy, how we actually uh, construct these stories or where we go to find these stories. The stories are never told to the end. We leave it just usually, you know, before the climax, like a cliffhanger. And then we invite the group or the individuals to imagine the end themselves. So they have to think, how, how will it develop? What will happen then? And afterwards, you know, they exchange the end, they do a drama, they make drawings, depending on what the group likes to do. So we have various ways, actually, of working with it. We might have a performance. This might be, you know, go for two hours, might be short for half an hour. Depending on the group, it has to be the dynamic. Then the next step comes, and the next step, it's uh, we try to make a transference, transfer, uh, transfer the issues and the, the, the strategies, the, the structure and the, the sayings, which in the drama or in the painting, we try to connect it to the lives of the people. And we find them that usually there's a lot of very valuable new ideas inside which develops spontaneously in the drama, which are applicable to the lives of the people or the respective group. And for us, this is like um, a mean, an approach to find solutions in groups or individuals when they're blocked, but they, they can't move on. So it's actually 
you could also call it as a uh, an, an approach or a strategy to enhance creativity in the in the individual of them. But this is you know, we have various ways of yes, uh, fascinating. I, I can't wait to participate. Um, when you um, uh, address the the conference that will take place this this autumn in in the United States in Santa Fe, uh, the theme is going to be <clears throat> how to um, how to create opportunities for dialogue in a situation where it is so blocked that people have made up their minds, they're entrenched in positions, uh, and they can no longer speak to each other. And this even happens in families or in couples. They have different political views. The politics in the United States these days are very, very polarized. Um, do you have any reflections on how your approach might um, address political issues like that. Well, in Switzerland, we've been working with also groups which uh, have the same phenomena, you know, which were completely polarized. When we work with, we have to sometimes work with groups of teachers or in the trains, you know, which are completely op op opposed to each other and have convictions that fight each other. We realize that in the drama, one the very first. Um, point we have to realize is you can't solve that particular conflict. If someone's convinced of, of his solution, he doesn't change his, his or her mind. Impossible. So what you do, you refocus. You try to introduce something else. You try to uh, introduce another s scheme, uh, get, sort of transport everyone to another topos, another area. That's what it is. So when we work with groups like that, we tell them, Okay, you don't agree with each other, that's okay. You hate each other, you despise the point of view of the other, that doesn't matter. But would you join him in, in this, you know, this story or this drama? And most of the time we say, okay, you know, that's fine, but you know, we, we, we might as well participate in this crazy idea, this psychology has, you know, he's, he's a bit mad himself. And so, and then, of course, we try to refocus on another topic by uh, producing, uh, you know, proposing a story, but the story has to be a bit radical. That's very important. It's if we if we give them a story, you know, about which has morals in it, or a story which is a sort of about how to behave, educational notion, then it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. the stories we give, they're really mind openers. They're crazy. They're wild, you know, and they might even. Uh, radicalize an issue which these various people have. I'll give you an example. We once yeah. worked with a group of adolescents. And these adolescents were beating up people who sort of had, um, had strange behavior. Some of them were handicapped. So we told them, you know, of course they thought, well, they're, they're, they're provoking us, you know, they were criticizing them. So we told them a story and we tell them in a certain way, so it's really acceptable. We told them a story about the gang in the Bronx. So it was another setting, another scene. It wasn't in their neighborhood. That's how they could listen to the story, which was specializing on attacking young people on, in wheelchairs and dumping them out of the wheelchairs and then watching them whining on the floor and having great fun with it. And by telling that story, suddenly their attitude starts to change. To say, "Well, but this is uh, this is outrageous. You know, this is it's too much, right. too far. Too much. This is crazy." And then gradually their mood, their attitude started to change. And so that's that's actually the approach we do. So we I see. You sort of take them over the edge and then bring them back, and they start thinking a different way. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Well, I think we need some of that treatment <laughs> among the politicians in the United States. Uh, take them over the edge and see if they come back a little bit. Um, think yeah. you know, that's, that's important. People think things to the end of the line. Yeah. And to get people out of their heads a little bit and out of their opinions and use their imagination. That's a whole different uh, function. Yeah. I think we human beings are uh, beings which have a, always a reduced view of life. But we have creativity, but we have not always connected to our creativity. 
I have the feeling you've got a very strong trickster component in your personality. Your father did too. He was famous for it, um, kind of contrarian views and sort of overthrowing the apple cart and everybody is astonished and <laughs> don't know what to say, but they start thinking in a different way. So maybe you inherited this as well. Do you enjoy that? No. Uh, you know. <laughs> Something which is also, as you know, is it's discussed in Jungian psychology whether Jung was a trickster and so on. Yes. I think Jung yeah. wrote also something about that. Yeah, yeah. And taking the opposite um, gets people to reflect and to yes, kind absolutely. of create a polarized situation, create one, yeah. 